Conspiracy theories aren't a thing, except that everyone is against me. Donald Trump's presidential candidacy was born of a false conspiracy theory that Barack Obama, remember him, was born outside the United States and therefore could not legally serve as president. Trump, at the time, was a reality TV star with a political bug, but without any obvious in to appeal to the base of either party, so he seized on birtherism and wrote it to credibility with Republicans who wanted to believe the worst of Barack Obama, facts be damned. Now, since then, Trump has shown a willingness and a verve to embrace conspiracy theories kicking around the conservative fever swamps of the internet, not to mention getting in on the act and starting a few of his own. So here's a not totally complete list of the many conspiracy theories Donald Trump has advocated. Ted Cruz's father may have been connected to the JFK assassination. Three to five million people voted illegally in the 2016 election. Barack Obama ordered a wiretap of Trump Tower during the election. Longtime Clinton aide Vince Foster may not have killed himself. Muslims were celebrating on New Jersey roofs on September 11, 2001. Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia may have been murdered. Climate change might not actually be a thing. And Trump's voice might not actually be his voice on the Access Hollywood tape. Also, Democrats were purposely inflating the death toll in Puerto Rico following Hurricane Maria. Now, important, I wish was unnecessary, but is necessary sidebar. We should remind you here that none of these things are remotely true and have all been repeated in one way or another by the President of the United States. Ugh, bleh. Now, of late, Trump has fixated on a new conspiracy theory that the Democratic National Committee email server, which you will remember, was hacked by the Russians during the 2016 election, is in fact in Ukraine and contains information never turned over to the FBI during the investigation of Russian interference. <laughs> Quote, it's not only a conspiracy theory, it is completely debunked. That's former Trump Department of Homeland Security advisor Tom Bossert on the Ukraine conspiracy theory. But here's the thing. Trump has embraced and pushed so many conspiracy theories that we now have a sort of blueprint for how he does these things. And, and this is really sad, how these smears work for him politically. So without further ado then, <laughs> the anatomy of a Donald Trump smear. Step one, make false statement. So every smear and the conspiracy theory it spawns has to start somewhere. We all started somewhere. Started from the bottom, now we're here. And more often than not, in Trump's presidency, that origin of the conspiracy theory is the president himself. Take the conspiracy that millions of people voted illegally in 2016. That all began just after Thanksgiving of that year when Trump tweeted this, quote, in addition to winning the Electoral College in a landslide, I won the popular vote if you deduct the millions of people who voted illegally." End quote. Now, Trump offered no proof to back up this major allegation. He just, you know, said it. Step two, repeat, repeat, repeat. So once Trump has suggested that something might be true, that facts tell you isn't true, he then uses his massive social media megaphone, not to mention the wall-to-wall -wall cable TV coverage of his presidency, to broadcast this falsehood nonstop. So continuing with the illegal votes example, Trump has repeated some version of his original false claim dozens of times since he initially floated it almost three years ago. Days after he was inaugurated as president, Trump reportedly told a group of Republican elected officials that three to five million illegal votes had been cast in the election as a way of explaining why he had lost the popular vote by nearly three million votes to Hillary Clinton. At an official White House event in West Virginia in the spring of 2018, Trump had this to say, quote, in many places, the same person in California votes many times. And he went on to add, they always like to say, oh, that's a conspiracy theory. It's not a conspiracy theory. Millions and millions of people, and it's very hard because the state guards their records, end quote. Incomplete sentence, anyone? That's fine. At a spring 2019 fundraising event for House Republicans, Trump suggested that Democrats were stealing votes in select House races. And I quote, you've got to be a little bit more paranoid than you are, Trump told Republicans. He added, we have to be a little bit careful because I don't like the way the votes are being tallied. I don't like it. You don't like it either. You just don't want to say it because you're afraid of the press. You're afraid of the press." End quote. Step number three, 
Trump's claim is debunked, he doubles down. Now, inevitably, Trump's false claim on whatever comes under scrutiny from the media and the growing group of fact checkers dedicated to testing the president's statements and providing context for them. The reports from the fact checkers often go like this. There's simply no basis for the claim Donald Trump is making. For example, PolitiFact gave a pants on fire, so good, ruling to the president's illegal vote allegations, concluding this quote, the statement is not accurate and makes a ridiculous claim, end quote. <laughs> you would say that. Now, while most politicians would refrain from continuing to make a claim that has been repeatedly debunked, Trump actually uses the fact checks as part of his building narrative. Quote, the Washington Post is a fact checker only for Democrats, tweeted Trump in February 2019. For the Republicans and for your all-time favorite president, it is a fake fact checker. End quote. And suddenly, the story, at least for some American voters, is less about the original false claim and more about why the media is bad. Step number four, never, ever apologize. So even as the fact checks keep piling up, and even some Republicans admit, usually privately, that they are baffled as to why Trump keeps repeating a false claim, the president devoutly refuses to ever give an inch or even consider acknowledging that he made, you know, a mistake. Now that move is straight out of the playbook of Roy Cohn, a friend of Trump's father and a mentor to the young Trump. Cohn, not for nothing, was also chief counsel to Senator Joe McCarthy, remember him? During the Red Scare of the 1950s. Cohn believed that apologizing in any form was a sign of weakness and handed your enemies an easy club to bash you with. Step five and the final step, the lie lives. So the four previous steps can take as little as a few days and are proof of that old adage that a lie can travel halfway around the world before the truth can get its boots on. I would be interested in a video of the truth getting its boots on, unrelated. See, by the time any sort of context or, you know, facts are added on to Trump's falsehood, the lie is already out in the world and <laughs> running free. That was my running impersonation. And because of the deep and toxic political polarization that Trump has weaponized, there are millions of people who want to believe the lie is the truth and the truth is a lie. Which reminds me of this quote from George Orwell's 1984, quote, and if all others accepted the lie which the party imposed, if all records told the same tale, then the lie passed into history and became truth. And that is the point. We make new point episodes every Tuesday and Thursday. Check them all out.